stand, and I'm going to read our call to worship this morning from Psalm 95. And I'm going to read verses 1 through uh, 6, I believe. Psalm 95, 1 through 6. Is that what I have, Maddie? No. Great. All right. Well, just listen to the word of the Lord then. Psalm 95, 1 through 6. O oh, come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. Let us come into his presence with thanksgiving. Let us make a joyful noise to him with songs of praise. For the Lord is great and a great king above all gods. In his hand are the depths of the earth. The heights of the mountains are his also. The sea is his, for he made it, and his hands formed the dry land. O oh, come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord our maker. I really feel like I should read the next one. For he is our God, and we are the people of his pasture and the sheep of his hand. Amen. Only because that's a, a chorus that we've sung, or that I've sung from the early, probably 80s, I guess. Um, but it's taken directly from that song. We are in a new month, if you haven't realized that already, and um, this, this is uh, from an album released by City of Light um, not too long ago, and it's simply called This Is The Day, which is also another psalm that, uh, that you are all familiar with. This is the day that the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. So you already know most of the song, so let's uh, sing this together. as you become familiar with it. It goes like this. This is the day that the Lord has made. We will rejoice as we lift His name. This is the day that the Lord has made. Come and rejoice. We will rejoice and be glad in
This is the day. Come and sing your praise. For the Lord now reigns on the throne of grace. Soon is the day he will bring us home. And we have this hope. For we are his own. This is the day. Come and sing your praise. This is the day. I think I was supposed to repeat that one more time. It goes like this. And this is the day. Come and sing your praise. For the Lord now reigns on the throne of grace. Soon is the day he will sing. This is the day, this is the day that the Lord has made. We will rejoice as we lift His name. This is the day that the Lord has made. Come and rejoice, we will rejoice and be glad in it. This is the day that the Lord has made. This is the day that the Lord has made. Come and rejoice, we will rejoice and be glad in it. Come and rejoice, we will rejoice and be glad in it. Whether the sun will shine, whether the skies will rain, I know that you are this is the day you've made. I bet we know that really good at the end of the month, won't we? Amen.
Continue with our time of worship and prayer here this morning. I want to start us off to guide us in prayer by reading Psalm 131. It says, O Lord, my heart is not lifted up. My eyes are not raised too high. I do not occupy myself with things too great and too marvelous for me. But I have calmed and quieted my soul like a weaned child with its mother, like a weaned child is my soul within me. O Israel, hope in the Lord from this time forth and forevermore. Sometimes it's hard to quiet our souls, and it's hard to lift our hearts up. But nonetheless, when we have the hope of Christ and the hope of the Lord, we have that opportunity to do that. So let's, let's pray together. Father, how overwhelming at times this world can seem for us, the turmoil inside of our hearts and outside of us into this world, dear Lord, sometimes it is so difficult to even calm our minds and to still our hearts, Lord, to just lift up and sing praise to you. Father, whenever there is brokenness that is around us, it is hard for us to even feel whole even when we are in your presence, but yet in your presence, Lord, we know that we are made whole, and we give you praise for that, Lord. Father, we know that there are so many things that are going on in this body of believers right here, and as we gather here this morning to just worship you and to hear your word taught and proclaimed, as we learn today about the importance of the gathering of the church, Father, and how we come together to worship you, and we see, Lord, that through that body of believers that we carry burdens for one another. We are there to lift up those who are weak. And when we are weak, we are lifted up by those who are strong, Father. And we just are thankful for the way that you make this work all together. And right now, dear Lord, I just think as my heart is heavy, as I just sit here and pray for Sherry and Josh Frick, dear Lord. And Lord... Our heart is heavy because of what Sherry is going through. But yet, Lord, we can see her life and the testimony that she has been to us over these last several years and these last few months, Lord. And we get to see your glory shine in her life all the more. And that is something, Father, that as hard as it is to see, it is something that we will get to hold on to for the rest of our lives as we think about your mercy and your grace being poured out through one who loves you and seeks you and wanted you glorified above everything else that she goes to, Father. We get to see the hope in the midst of death, Father, as we see just the way that she has carried herself. And man, Lord, I am thankful for that. And I'm thankful to see the faithfulness of Josh and just his love for you. And the steadfastness, Father, and the love that he has for Sherry, and the willingness to walk through this with her. And I know they both need your strength right now, dear Lord, and they both need our encouragement. 
they both need our love, Father. And I just pray that they can feel that right now, Lord. I pray that they feel the love we have for them as a church, as a body that has gathered with them for so long. I pray, Father, that they can rejoice in knowing that you are the one that is sustaining them through this time and that you are the one that is prompting us to pray, Father, for them. And Lord, I just pray that you will just allow your love to be magnified through that. I want to pray the same, Father, right now for Bill Harvey and his family. As they got a road ahead of them that is uncharted, Lord, and I just pray that you can give them peace. Be with Bill as he goes to these doctor's appointments. And Father, we see the feebleness of, of our humanity right now and displayed. As everything is so far out of our control, Lord, and he's probably experiencing that right now. So is his family. But Lord, it's not out of your control. And I pray that for Brenda and Andrew and Billy and their families, dear Lord, that they will just be able to just cling to you in this moment and just steal their hearts, Father. I pray that their, their soul will be quieted as they go through this time and that you will give them peace and, and magnif be magnified all the more. Lord, I, I think about our brothers and sisters right now in Pakistan where it's just been devastated by flooding in the last month, Father, and they're starting a rebuilding process. And Lord, just the, the Pakistanian people by far and large do not know you. And we have brothers and sisters who've risked it all to be in that country, Lord, risked life and death. And I, right now, Lord, is their time to shine with your hope and be bright with the light, Father, with a time when people are receptive to wanting to know what hope they can have because they can't earn it, Lord. It's only by your grace. So I pray that you will give them opportunities. And I pray that it'll be without persecution at this time that they can see that the love of those who love you is showering down upon them, Father. And I pray that it will cause them to ask the questions of what the hope is that they have in them after seeing the devastation take place. And when they answer it, they can answer it with a sounding. The hope that I have is within Jesus Christ who died for every man, woman, and child's sin in this world, Father, and that they will turn to them and surrender their life to you. And I thank you, Father, for the faithfulness of this body of believers as we are just seeing people rise up to help with the darkness and tear out of the Lord. And we start to see fruits there. As we start to see people asking questions, Lord, and just wanting to, to know if you're worth it, Father. And we see them coming back, even though some of them don't even have a clue, Father, what it means to worship you, what it means to follow you. We are thankful for the faithfulness of those that are going. And I, Father, I see just the desire within Ryan and Rachel and Colton and Jenny, Father, hearts and Jeremy and Tina's and Timmy's, Lord, to just pour out their lives into, these, into this community, Father. And, man, I'm thankful for that. What an encouragement it is to see that and see the time that it has taken to diligently disciple one another over there, Father. Man. It's just a beautiful picture, Father, of what your church is supposed to do. As we gather here as a body of believers, Father, don't let us be deceived that we want everybody to stay here. We want them to go out, Father. As hard as it may be, we want them to go out to plant. We want them to go out to share, to proclaim your word, Father. And if that leads to churches being planted in neighboring counties all around us so that people can get to it who have no, lost, no way of transportation, who are lost, have no hope, Father, then so be it. Let this church be the sending church that carries out the mission that you've called us all to do, sacrificially loving those around us, Father. And I just pray for Colton right now, Father, as he comes, my dear brother, to just proclaim your word. I pray that you quiet his soul, lift up his heart, Father, silence anything that he is going to say, Father, maybe that he is questioning, but lift up your spirit to where he can boldly proclaim it if he is supposed to, Lord. I pray that it is you that we hear. And just fill this place and this church with your spirit now. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Good morning, church. If you want to go ahead and start flipping your Bibles there, we'll be in Acts chapter 2, verse 42. Through 47, at least we're going to be there for the first portion. 
um, of the message, and then we're going to hop over to Hebrews for a little bit. <clears throat> well, um, I did want to, just, just before we get into the message this morning, just preface that um, I'm interrupting the, uh, the Genesis series that we've been working through, um, the book of Genesis, and in no way do I want anybody to assume that this is, that, that my lean or preference is against the practice of expositional preaching, that, that in any way am I against the practice of what our elders have faithfully led us in, um, as far as I know, for many years uh, before I even came here. And so I, um, I rejoice in the fact that that's the normal practice of our church, is that we get in a book of the Bible and we're going to set our plow down and we're going to move through it um, pretty much consecutively, pretty much um, until we, we get to at least a good stopping point and then we'll probably come back, things like that. Um, but this morning, I, I am going to interrupt it and, and we're going to kind of pull out what we call a topical sermon. Um, and and I'll, I'll be honest, one of the reasons that I asked the pastors if, if, if I could do that instead of continuing in Genesis is because I'll be honest, narrative the, the, the idea of the Bible telling story and preaching from that, it intimidates me. I'll just be up front to, to whenever I knew we were in Genesis. To me, uh, taking what the, the, the narrative and the storyline, that, that's what Genesis is. The Gospels are a narrative. And then faithfully standing up and laboring what was the author's intention of these passages, that is a hard work. And I'm just grateful for the, the labor that all of our, our pastors have, have done in that work. And, and I kind of took the easy way out. And I said, hey, can I, do you guys mind if I do a topical? There's something burning on my heart that I'd really like to do. Um, and I'll be in Terre Alta this afternoon as well, preaching this same message. So if you fall asleep this morning, I expect to see you there. Um, but but it, was, it was a burning kind of out of that, that burden of, of what we're doing, this, this early church plant roots being set that, man, I just thought, I really want to get this message out. I really want to, I want, and I even, even for my own soul, I want to solidify us in, is this thing we do on a weekly basis, is it biblical? What kind of conviction should you feel when you miss a Sunday gathering or a Saturday gathering? I'm not, I'm not going to even talk about whether the church should gather on Sunday or Saturday or Wednesday or whatever. I'm, I'm kind of hands off on that. I don't, I'm not feel a strong pull that the text kind of tells us it has to be a certain day of the week. There certainly was a, a practice of the early church in that, but, but nonetheless, should you feel some type of conviction when you wake up in the morning, you're like, should, should we go? It was a late night, we, you know, we had this or that, and, and so I just, I want to hopefully just tether us all, this is what I feel like the Lord has done in me is in preparing this message, is tether you to what has God said about gathering with believers, what importance does it hold for your life? And I think this message has potential for kids. Um, if you're listening, if you're tuning in this morning, and I'd encourage you, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try to talk to you. I'm going to try to even use some of your little, uh, the, the, the bulletin things that they've created for you um, and, and try to navigate. So please try to lean in. I'm going to try to lean towards you as well and, and touch base with you. But kids, this has huge impact as you're growing up in the, the umbrella of faith, your parents' prayers, our prayers, is that you would grab hold of faith, that you would see Jesus as beautiful and good and worth far more than anything else in the whole world, anything else than the whole, in the whole universe. And that in, in doing this, that you at an early age would be able to look forward as you consider career, as you consider marriage, as you consider um, family, as you consider where to live, as you consider what are, what's going to be the rhythms of life for you looking forward, that this message, that today the Word of God is going to put a stamp on your life as a, what kind of prioritization gathering with believers has. I think it's that important. For some of us, we're older in our years, and so maybe we, we can't go back and change the conviction maybe you've had in the past, but by all means, I would encourage you, do not wallow if you feel guilt or if, there's, if you feel like, man, that's not, I never understood, I never knew that that's how important this was. But I just want to encourage you, we're, we're, we're uh, I don't know, are we ending with a song today? I, 
Are we? Yes, very good. Okay, so we're ending with a song. I'm hopeful. I don't know what it is yet, but, but I like it when we end with a song because typically our songs are going to draw us back to the, the throne of grace, draw us back to Christ as the center, uh, the emphasis of the gathering of the church. And so that's going to be important for you if you've said, hey, I haven't lived my life under that conviction. I've somehow missed that verse. I've somehow missed the uh, importance of this matter in my life. Well, Receive the forgiveness and the grace that God bestows on you and go and flourish under his word moving forward, no matter how many more days you have. That's my encouragement to you as we get prepared. So if you wish, let's, uh, if you want to stand for the reading of his word, if you have kids, I understand sometimes it's, uh, I'll, I'll confess, sometimes I sit with my kids because I'm like, hey, I want them to look at the word and they get excited about opening their Bibles. So sometimes I sit during this. I hope that doesn't offend anybody, but I, I'm just releasing you on that. If you've got kids and you're like, it's easier for me to sit and help them track with the words, by all means, do it. It honors God to get their eyes on the word of God, okay? Acts 2, verse 42 and they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and the prayers. And awe came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. And all who believed were together and had all things in common, and they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. And day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. This is the word of God for us. You can have a seat. So to bring you up to speed again, this is why we have the normal practice in our gathering that we typically would it would be ideal if we were working through the book of Acts because we'd all be like, hey, we know where we've been. We know where this guy's picking up. We know the, the storyline, the narrative that's taking place. So I just want to fill that in real quick because we've not been doing it. So this is early Acts, right? We're in Acts chapter 2, very early. The gospel kind of, one, you know, you could be reading the gospels. Gospel ends, Jesus dies, raised again. Early Acts, and again, I didn't refresh myself too much on the specific details of, of early Acts, but if I'm recalling right, rightly, Jesus appears to, I couldn't remember, is it 40, 400? He, he appears to, to so many, um, not just the apostles, uh, but, uh, but he appears to a lot of people. And ultimately, he tells the disciples, hey, go wait, and the Holy Spirit, the spirit of power will come upon you. So they gather together and they're waiting and just before these verses, I believe it's right in the beginning of chapter 2, uh, flaming tongues fall upon them. And they begin to, the apostles are gathered, and they begin to speak in the languages of people, in, in people's languages of who all's gathered. This is Pentecost, so there's a large gathering already in the town, and, and people hear them. And I, I don't know exactly what happens if they go outside or if they just hear them. But, but anyways, they're, they're speaking the gospel and all these people from different places are understanding them in their own language. And so they begin to, the, 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 uh, Luke tells us in Acts that these people hearing them begin to say, are they, what's going on here? Do you hear them in your language? Do you, I hear them in my language. How is this happening? How are they speaking our languages? And some are like, they're drunk. They're somehow just getting it right luckily. And, and, and they're just, they're baffled by the miraculous thing happening here. And then Peter kind of, as a crowd forms, because they're just, Baffled by this thing, Peter stands up, and this is amazing if you track with the character of Peter. Peter goes from this guy, and I don't want to be too harsh on him because I'd probably just be in the same boat if I, was, if I was there with Jesus, but goes from denying Jesus, afraid of little girls, and, and if, you, if you remember that in the Gospels, he's denying Jesus to little girls. She's like, he was with him. No, I'm not. And this is Peter. And all of a sudden, the flaming tongues, the spirit falls on him, and Peter stands up. And he gets everybody's attention. And he explains how the Old Testament and the prophecies and Jesus fulfilled it. And he came. And that God is moving after 400 years of silence. There's a great new thing happening. And he explains it. And the people are persuaded. They see, they understand. And they say, what do we do? And he says, how's it end in verse 40? 
Um, And with many other words, he bore witness and continued to exhort them, saying, save yourselves from this crooked generation. And the practical overflow of, of what he taught comes in 41. So those who received his word were baptized and there were added that day about 3,000 souls. So this is, this is really exciting because I think one of the, the questions that maybe has not ever been answered in your, in your mind is like, okay, I've, I've come to believe, now what? I, I do. I believe that Jesus died for my sins. I believe that he's reigning on high. I believe that he was the son of God, that he is God. I believe that. Now what? And kids, I'm, again, please tune in. When you place your faith in Christ, if your next question is, now what? What do I do, God? Where do I go? What do I do? I think we have a beautiful illustration here of of what was taught for them to do. And it starts in verse 42. So if you're looking at your outlines, I I meant to point this out earlier. I'm I switched things around. Diane was extremely gracious with me, as she always is, and asked for an outline. And I got her the outline, and then I was like, hey, change this, actually, uh, on that same day. And then about two days later, I didn't bother letting her know, but I was like, ah, I'm going to change things again after I kind of solidified it. So if you're following the outline, we're actually going to start in uh, point number three. So under why do we gather, we've kind of got three main points, really just two, but But uh, point number three, what is the matter of our gathering? So this title, I intentionally wanted someone ambiguous. If you're digging a hole in your backyard, and that's all I see you doing, and I walk up and I see you, I'm going to walk up and I say, hey, why are you digging a hole? And you're going to tell me that the purpose for which you're digging that hole. You're going to say, well, unfortunately, the dog died last night, or the cat died, and we're burying under the tree, and, and here's what's going on. And so you've told me the subject matter of why you're burying the hole. But I also, maybe I'm walking by and I see you in your backyard and you're digging a hole with a shovel, but I see there is a perfectly good backhoe sitting behind you. And I might walk in and I say, hey, why are you digging the hole? Meaning, why aren't you using the backhoe? And there you're not necessarily telling me, I'm not asking about the purpose of your hole digging. I'm asking Why are you doing it? What's the motivation for you doing it? And then you might tell me, well, unfortunately, it had a hose break, and it won't be in for a while. i got to get this hole dug, and and so forth. So the the why question has kind of two ways that it can be interpreted, and I intentionally wanted to phrase the title of this sermon because I want to answer both. Why do we, we gather? Why do we gather? So what is the matter? What is the composition of our gathering together? What is... What, does the Bible give us any indication of what you and I should do when we gather together? And so I want to tackle that first. After the, I'll, I'll, I'll speak briefly on the who should gather, so it's kind of second. And then we'll jump to point number two. What is the motivation for our gathering? Why do we gather? What, what's, what's compelling us, okay? It was all introductory matter that I should have covered a little bit earlier. So point number three, and that's where we're in Acts 2.42. They devoted themselves, kids, here's your fill-ins, to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and the prayers. The apostles' teaching. I think we have good reason to think when we hear the apostles' teaching, the word of God. Okay, when, when the New Testament or when the, when the church is formed here in Acts 2, they don't have the written gospels. They don't have Hebrews. They don't have Romans. They don't have First and Second Corinthians. They don't have the New Testament. They have the Old Testament. And so I believe that that's kind of put in here. But, but what they have is the apostles' teachings. Well, what are the apostles' teachings? It's our New Testament, is it not? Is it not the letters, the, the I'm, I'm getting ahead of myself, but we're going to see here in a quote of an early Christian leader, and he calls them the memoirs of the, of the apostles, so the written letters. That is, the New Testament is the apostles' teachings. It's the, the teachings unfolding, and I said this once in, in, in Teralda in our, one of our gatherings, that um, the New Testament 
from, and I'm using some third-hand information. I didn't look into it exactly myself, but an analysis was done, and they found that there's only three books of the New Testament that don't seem to, to directly allude to the Old Testament. There's only three. All the other New Testament books are pulling from the Old Testament. It's really encouraging. It's really encouraging if you want to be encouraged by the consistency of the whole word of God and the testimony we have. So the teaching of the apostles, that is what we know as the New Testament. They devoted themselves to to the apostles saying, hey, this what was spoke long ago and this what was done long ago is fulfilled in Christ. And and we see this in the new covenant. And and, and this is is how things were coming to be and how it's been fulfilled and, and what's to come forward. And this is the teachings of Jesus, right? Jesus told the apostles, Kids, help me out here. What, what did Jesus say to do? Go and go make disciples of all nations. I hear a lot of adults baptizing them in the name of the Father and Son and, and teaching them all that I have commanded you. Yes, teaching them all that I have commanded you. So the apostles are doing what they've been told to do. So the church is devoted. They're devoted to the word of God that's being shown as authoritative through the apostles. That's why I think we have the reference of the many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles because God is making it abundantly clear. These guys know what they're talking about. I've appointed them. I selected them. Jesus walked with them and taught them for three years. So that's point one, the apostles' teaching. Or again, I'm, I'm content with saying the word of God. Point number two, they gathered and they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship. The fellowship, that's um, three, two, three, two. I don't know how they're doing it up on the screen. But uh, so the fellowship. Now, I think in one sense we do grasp what fellowship is, right? We understand that fellowship is, it's kind of this relating, this, this connecting, this um, Mutual relationships that we form, um, this one anothering, I think, is a good way to think about it. But I do think that this verse helps us out here. Uh, I don't want to get too technical with you, but I broke this out into 2A and 2B um, because, meaning the fellowship, after fellowship, it says, to the breaking of bread and the prayers, that it was pointed out to me as I was looking into it that that the typical Greek construct would have an and in between each one of these elements if they were supposed to be thought of as a series of elements. So you would have um, the apostles' teaching and the fellowship and the breaking of bread and the prayer, but that's not how it was written. It's the apostles' teaching and the fellowship to the breaking of bread and the prayers. And so to me, I, I, I was persuaded that we should see this description of the breaking of bread and prayers as kind of a, 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 an explanation of what does this fellowship look like? What's this one anothering look like? Okay? And right now, by the way, I'm just, I don't, don't check out too much. I know I'm, I'm doing what I, I would call, I'm doing a lot of teaching right now. Um, the second half of this, I'm hoping to, I'm going to try to preach and just fuel you into uh, encouragement and obedience of the word. So, so keep with me. I know it's a little dry, but I just want to teach these things a little bit for a moment. And so the breaking of bread and the prayers. I don't think when we see the breaking of bread, what do you think of? Communion. That's what, what we typically think of. Now, I, but again, I, maybe I'll be corrected, but my understanding is that's not always what's going on. Breaking of bread can be referring to just the meals, the sharing of meals. And I, I think that's important too, because what was the first, I'm going to give it away. What was the first supper? It was a meal, right? So the, the sharing of the meal, it took on a certain, uh, it, there was something instantiated that we call the Lord's Supper, communion, that, that, that was legit, real, sacrament, um, but, but there's this kind of mingling of it was a meal. And so I, I would take this text to say, man, they, they, were, they were gathering and their fellowship was sharing meals together and praying together. I think that's in the text as well as we see in verse 46. And day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes. We see the same phrase, 
but it said day by day, which I don't think they were doing communion every day. I, I, it, maybe they were, but I, I, I'm not, I don't know. I'm not trying to answer that question, but I'm just saying there certainly seems to be some implications that their meal sharing was part of what fellowship meant, and the praying together was part of what fellowship meant. And so I think that's important for us to observe and, and to allow it to kind of work on us a little bit. Um, namely, one of the things that I think we're going to feel a little bit of pressure out of this message this morning is because we're, uh, we're Americans— and individualism, and everybody owns their own house, and, and you, and, 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 and you kind of, you, you, you own cars, and you don't depend on other people, and, and you know, independence is just, just we're, we're pushing it into every compartment of our life, and that that's what the American way is, and I feel like it is really, really, um, it's, it's going to bump up against us in what the Bible teaches in following Christ because I think that there is a, a dependency, a natural, um, a natural coming together that the Christian life should look like, particularly for the church, that, that is not natural to Americans. And so I'm just going gonna, gonna to leave that at that, but I think this idea of sharing your meals together and, and praying together, that's what's going on in the fellowship. These are the two things that these people were devoted to. And again, I'm not even yet telling you that this is, this is not, what's the phrase? This is not prescriptive, this is descriptive. So you can be saying in your seat right now, hey, Colton, it's not telling us we have to do that. That's what they did. We don't have to do that. And you'd be right. So it's just describing something but I just want to impress on you that that's what they devoted themselves to. This is what new believers, you're baptized, you profess faith in Christ, and this is what they did. And they knew the guys who walked with Jesus, and I think that should impact you in a major way. They devoted themselves to the Word of God and to fellowship, which is eating together and praying together. So let that just... Fill your mind. And that's, that's pretty much the, the fullness of, of what I wanted to make sure we, we at least saw. This is, what is the matter of, of gathering together? What is the matter of the church? And I never really did answer point number one, but I've been implying it. Uh, I apologize for that. But I think that the implications of who should gather are believers. I think this is obviously, that's, that's who's gathering. The 3,000 souls added on that day are people who have repented and they're baptized into Christ. That's who we're going to be talking about, okay? Um, I think that is important. I'm, I'm well aware. Uh, I've had some personal relationships with some churches that uh, that, is not, that is not the center focus of, of what they think about for the gatherings, and I'm not going to critique, but I am going to just tell you, if you move from here and you leave this church and you go looking at churches, I do want to put on your forefront, this is not in all agreement across the United States. There are churches that say, well, we have host our gathering for what, what they would say is, we, we want to hit both, unbelievers and believers, and we're, gonna, we're focusing, we're preparing our entire service um, if you will, the entire, the songs they sing, the prayers they pray, the language they use, the sermon, the Bible topics, uh, the passages, they are intentionally crafting those because they have in mind, this morning, we're going to have believers and unbelievers, and we just, we, we want to take advantage of that. And again, I'm not, I'm not critiquing on that. I, I've got my own opinions on it, but I just want to put that before you that Let's look at what the Bible kind of sets an example of, and, and I'd encourage you to, to go with that, that that should be molding you in how you think about what is gathering with the church, what, what should it look like, what's the thrust of it. Now, I don't want to totally deny Paul in uh, 1 Corinthians or 2 Corinthians, when he's wide older, when he refers that there may be uh, unbelievers enter in during prophecy, any elders recalling, it's one of those. Um, but he refers to an unbeliever will enter the space of the worship gathering and a certain thing by God's grace will happen, okay? So I'm not denying that unbelievers are probably going to be sitting in our midst. 
And God will use what our gathering uh, of focusing on his word and on our fellowship, he will use that to speak to them um, in a, in a God-glorifying way, okay? But I, but I think, it again, just setting our bounds here, devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, the word of God, and to the fellowship, the breaking of bread and prayers. Okay. So let's go up to point number two. Um, what is the motivation for our gathering? Oh, I did want to, kids... If you're working on this thing right here, um, I think Diane threw you a curveball because uh, the, the, this bottom one, the early church devoted themselves to what? And I was like, okay, teaching, yes. Prayer, yes. Uh, probably not volleyball, but uh, not sleeping. Fellowship, yes. And then snacks. And I was like, mm, I, you know, so I'll, I'll leave it to you if you want to circle that one. But I'm like, man, the breaking bread, the sharing of meals, like I... I'm probably circling snacks. I'm just saying. Like, I think they, they shared, they devoted themselves to sharing this together. But uh, parents or elders, you can, you can give better direction on that if you want. What is the motivation for our gathering? If you want to flip your Bibles to Hebrews chapter 10, verse 19 through 25. Hebrews 10, 19. Fill in the blank number one under this section. What is the motivation for our gathering? This is the command. This is the command. Verse 19, Hebrews chapter 10, chapter 10, verse 19. Therefore, brothers, my brief, he's going to kind of give his own conclusion of the therefore. But this is Hebrews and And the Hebrews author has labored to to make it clear how Christ has entered the Holy of Holies. He is the great priest. He has sacrificed the sacrifice. The Old Testament um, process, procedure, uh, law of, of constantly we're offering sacrifices, constantly, just day in, day out, cranking it out. Jesus arrives Last sacrifice, final sacrifice. And then Jesus did something that the other priests would know very little about because of their role in the Old, Old Testament, in the, in the Old Covenant. Jesus sat down at the right hand of God because he fulfilled the priestly duty. There was no more sacrifices to be offered. It was done. This is what the Hebrews author is just driven through. So that's where he's going. Therefore, brothers and sisters, I have good grammatical arguments to you that Adelphoi, the Greek term for brothers, it's the masculine plural uh, for for brothers. Uh, It's used in the same time period. There's good arguments even outside of the Bible from, from records we have that the language is used to talk about men and women. It was just typical you'd use kind of the masculine um, plural at times to to refer to the whole crowd. So I think a good translation, NET does this. Therefore, brothers and sisters, I think the context tells us as well. Since we have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that he opened for us through the curtain, that is through his flesh, And since we have a great priest, still talking about Jesus, a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart. This is the beginning of the command. Let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Continuing on, let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day drawing near.
This is the closest thing, I would argue, we have to a command. To a command for us to do not live your life as a siloed Christian. Do not live your life as me and Jesus got our own thing going. Am I getting it right? You know that one? No? I had an uncle that we sang that a couple times in front of some nursing homes and stuff, and I was like, over time, I thought, this is not good. <laughs> we should not sing this. Uh, what, did it sound good? Great. Okay. So we would sing that, and, and just over time, the Lord kind of worked on me. Don't look it up. Don't, like, don't, don't sing that, and definitely don't live it. It's not you and Jesus got your own thing going. Jesus has got his own thing going, and he's bringing you in along with Look around, all the people around you. This is the closest thing. So if maybe you're feeling a little relief, like, great. That's not a command to be there on Sunday. Just keep listening. (laughs) 22 again, let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith. Again, this is all connected. I wish I... We'd, it'd be great. Maybe you guys have already recently done a, a, a series on Hebrews, and I just missed it. But just, this is all tied to all that's happening in Hebrews. But he says, because of Jesus, let's draw near. And, and the reference is in, in verse 21, we have a great priest over the house of God. Oikos is the Greek word here. Oikos, the house of God. Anybody, does that Who's the, what, what is the house of God? Is it, is it this building? No. No, it's not this building. Is it the, the church building? I don't know where the nearest church is in Oakland. Is it theirs? No. No, no, no. Peter says, you are being built into a holy temple. You, that's a, by the way, the Texans, they trained me. And their translation says, y'all. Y'all are the church. Y'all are the house. Now, I, I get it. I, I, I've, I've heard nod, and, and there is some nod to the, to, yes, when you, when Christ saves you, there's some, some just, it's, it's, kids, you're not saved by your parents' faith. So there's some personal things that God works. But, but at the end of the day, you better get connected with y'all. I heard one commentator look at this passage and he kind of, he took the analogy and said, think about in a sports game. Are you part of the team if you never go to practice or the games? No, you're not part of the team. Again, God can do some, uh, you can ask questions about the guy on the island who somehow comes to, finds a sheet of paper with the gospel on it and comes to faith and he's the only one. Okay, we'll let God work in that. I'm not going to speak above the Bible's authority, but... We're not on an island. So let's all just set our course, kids. You're thinking about your future right now. Let's be obedient to the word of God. Let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience. You don't have to come into the house of God with afraid and, 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 and fearful, and you're not and unsure about what's going to happen. This text makes it clear. You come to the house of God because it's safe there. Gather with his people because you won't find condemnation there. I think I've shared before, Piper used to use the analogy, or I've heard him use the analogy of, you want to teach kids, do you know what the fear of the Lord looks like? Do you want a good picture of this? It's, it's the big angry dogs that like to chase after, and they'll bite if you run away from them. But if you come towards them, that doesn't provoke in them a bite. I'm not, some dogs, maybe it does, but there, there is a big angry dog out there that this, this happens. And so he, he tells a story. I'm not going to retell it, but, but that's the image, is that if you wake up and you're like, I've sinned against God, church, run to him. Run to his people. Don't run to the closet. Don't run and hide. Don't fear. He's kind. He's a high priest. He knows Run to him and you'll find grace and forgiveness. This is what's going on here. Let us draw near. 
with hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. I'm not going to take a stab at telling you exactly what's going on with the pure water. I'll leave that for the pastors. Verse 23, let us hold fast with the confession of our hope without wavering for he who promised is faithful. Remember, when there's a four, ask what's it there for? So he tells you, hold fast the confession of your hope. Don't waver. Don't be afraid. Why? Because God, Jesus, is faithful. He will save you. He will forgive you. He is, I almost said safe. Narnia, I think, got it right. He might not be safe, but he's good, right? But in some ways, he's safe. Verse 24, here we go. This is what I meant to be preaching on the whole time. Sorry. <clears throat> let us, and let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day drawing near. Let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works. Eric Church, any other Eric Church fans? I like Eric Church, country music artist. He has a song and has nothing to do with this verse. But I thought the poetry, it was exhorting me the other day on the tractor in the hayfield. And he has this chorus and he says, soaking my soul in gasoline and lighting my heart on fire. And sorry if that's a little bit too much image for some of you, but for me, I thought that's, that's what I want the word of God to do. I want to just, just soak my soul in it, that it would just be all over me, and that the Holy Spirit would use the Word of God, light a match, and set my heart on fire. And I get it, fire can be dark, and it's, it's also an image of hell and destruction, but I think you get the point that I'm trying to make. Paul, or I'm sorry, not Paul, the Hebrews author, I don't know who wrote it, I always want to assume it's Paul, but... The Hebrews author says, let us consider, let us think about how to stir one another up to love and good works. What's this have to do with the gathering? He connects it. Keep reading. What's the contrast of this? Not neglecting to meet together as is the habit of some. Do you see this? He has two paths in mind for your life, Christians. There is, it's not meet together or don't meet together. That's not what he says, is it? He says, the assumption is you're going to meet together or you're not. And the assumption is, is if you are going to meet together, do so for this reason that you have been thinking about, that you have been meditating on, that you have prepared your mind and your heart for how you're going to get beside of your brother and your sister in Christ the next time you see them and, and encourage them and provoke them and, and move them and speak words of life into them so that they may go and do love and good works, that they may leave the gathering and that they may, the world may see those people are light and not darkness. Those people are love and not hate. Those people are marked by something divine. This is an assumption, not that you'll gather. This is, I mean, the assumption is that you'll gather, but the command is, if you're going to gather, do what you're supposed to do. Think about, before you even get there, how are you going to move your fellow brothers and sisters to love and good works? Back there, church, how are you going to pour gasoline so that they may go fueled up, fired up, and loving and doing good works. Piper's done a lot of work in his book, uh, Expositional Exaltation, I believe. I think that was the book. He's done a lot of work in one of the chapters saying this idea of love and good works, he would say that's the bottom line of, of why the church gathers. You could sum it all up. And I almost just preached that sermon in a sense. And in some ways, this is very related. I was helped by it. But, but if you're having any second guesses, this is why you gather. Glory to God through good works. The Ephesians 
210 passage, meant to look it up. Anybody got on the tip of their tongue? Christ died uh, and in order that you may do good works. It's something in that ballpark, yes? Yes, yes, we are his workmanship, prepared in Christ Jesus for good works. Uh, that we should walk in them, something like that. Yes, thank you. And, and, and so this is, this is the overflow, the, the outworking of your life, believer, from the moment you accept faith, from the moment you take faith, from the moment that you put your faith in Christ. After that, you want to you wanna create out your schedule for the rest of your life? Just write good works on every month. But Hebrews here is trying to help you in that. And you doing what you were meant to do is supposed to be, is God says it's going gonna, it's gonna to happen because of what your brothers, the people, go ahead. Take a look at the people's side of you. Look behind you. Go ahead. Do it. <laughs> These people that we gather and we sing with and we sit under the word of God with, have you thought about this past week, how you're going to stir them up to love and good works? Well, I did this past week because I knew it was coming. <laughs> I beseech you. The word of God beseeches you. Don't just check off a box you're gathering with the church. Do what you're supposed to be doing. Think about your brothers and sisters. Have fellowship with them in order that you can pray with them, have meals with them, and in order that you know their lives in such a way Right now, it's very intimate with Josh and Sherry Frick. We all know a lot about them. But I can assure you, there's a thousand troubles in this room right now in our hearts. And if the people beside of you, if, if believers don't know your troubles, and if you're not getting to know the troubles of the people beside of you, if you're not leaning in, if you're not inviting them for meals, if you're not diving in with them, you won't know how to encourage them to love and good works. You won't know how sin's creeping at the door. Let's, let's keep moving. I want to, originally I wanted to go back to Acts, but for time's sake, I, I, I want to go ahead and go down to Hebrews 3. The, the second box for motivation for our gathering, Acts 2.42, is the example. And again, we already looked at that text. And really what I just wanted to put before you is, is when you read that text, and they had all things in common, and I was going to comment that it says, they were, it says they were selling possessions and their belongings. You, some translations say their property. They were selling properties. There's, there's some evidence that that same Greek term can be translated property. And, and it's kind of precluding. We know that that does happen because if you get further in Acts, um, you get this couple. Is it, is it Ananias? I thought so. Okay, very good. Um, you get this couple that show up and they say, oh, we sold property. Here's the here's funds. We're, we're with the community. And Peter is informed by God. They're lying. They have a whole lot more. They sold that, but for a whole lot more than what they're saying they did. And judgment falls on this couple. And so anyways, this, this idea that I just wanted to emphasize that let, let that passage blow you away. Like, I, I think, I think it, it does me. The idea that people would sell houses or land and, and let me sell my Xbox and we'll have a turkey dinner tonight. Like, I just, I think that's beautiful. I just think it's so lovely. Sometimes I get a little bit excited. And by the way, this sermon is, I'll confess, it's a hobby horse for me. Like for years, this kind of, this, the talk of the local church. In seminary, it was actually really interesting I was part of a small group at my seminary, and I remember we were talking about the local church, and, and most of the guys, that I, the, my, my peers at the seminary were like, man, I just, they just had story after story of being burned by the local church, or even not just burned, but just, the, just kind of the deadness of how they felt about the local church and the difficulty of it. And, and just the Lord has just, that's not the view that I've had. That for me, the local church is just so beautiful. And no, she's not there yet. She's not there yet. But in the same way that 
I'm going way down a tra- rabbit trail right now, but, but in the same way that Tim Keller writes his book, The Meaning of Marriage, and he talks about you don't marry a person because they just are, they're that beautiful statue as they are. He says you marry them because you know there is a sculptor working on their life, and you know you can see what that thing's going to look like when it's all over, and you're like, I want in. I want to be part of the, the molding and the shaping because I know how beautiful she, how beautiful he will be when the sculptor is done. So young people, write that down. If you're looking for a spouse, don't go looking for beautiful statues. It's a lie if you find one. But find one that he or she knows and you know, he's still working on me. And you can see it and you're like, I love what God's molding you into. Come partner with me in ministry. Sorry, tying this back to the church. That's the local church. I've not seen an absolutely gorgeous, drop dead, 10 out of 10 church yet. But I see a whole lot of them that are going to be that. And it's a gift to be part of it and in it and molding with it. So that's what in Acts 2.42, I just love this like glimpse. And I'm not saying that's a 10 out of 10 church. I'm sure they had issues. And they come up, they show up, you keep reading. But nonetheless, there's just something beautiful about the selflessness and the corporate leaning on. One of a, a, a dear family a member of mine has accused me of, he's like, sounds like you want to form a cult. And I'm like, I don't care what you call it. I just think it's beautiful. Like, <laughs> I, I just... Fault me if you do, but I would love to be part of a, a, a body that's like, hey, let's, let's all live in the same neighborhood. And then we're just going to keep sharing Jesus and, and just let it ripple out. And I'd be like, all right, I'm in. Um, my wife's not so gun ho about the idea, but uh, I get a little crazy about it. So that was the example. Point number three. So essentially be our last point. Hebrews chapter three, verse 12. So once again, what is the motivation for our gathering? The command, Hebrews 10, 19. The example, Acts 2, 42. The warning, Hebrews 3, 12. Hebrews chapter 3, verse 12. Very much tied. And actually, there's a command in this as well, but I thought this one had the most potent warning, and so I thought, we'll call this the warning. Hebrews chapter 3, verse 10, or I'm sorry, verse 12 through 14. Take care, Adelphoi, brothers and sisters. It's not always brothers and sisters, but I think it is here again. Take care, brothers and sisters, lest there be in any of you an evil, unbelieving heart leading you to fall away from the living God but exhort one another every day as long as it is called today that none of you may be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. For we have come to share in Christ if indeed we hold our original confidence firm to the end. Verse 12 and 13. 13 starts with a but. Just to do a teach real quick. He's obviously contrasting with, with this, lest this happen. Lest there be in any of you an evil, unbelieving heart, and you fall away from the living God, exhort one another. Don't let that happen, but do this. Exhort one another every day as long as this is called today. Think here, exhort is the same as when we saw in the command. Consider how to stir one another up to love and good works. The connection here is sobering. I think in many ways, most of us have lived our lives and maybe not even wanting to. Maybe it's just, this is, I'm just telling you, I feel like this is the culture of Christianity in what I've experienced for the most part in the United States. That the culture is come to faith in Christ and again, it's, it's just this low humming of me and Jesus got our own thing going. It's this, no matter what, no matter what 
happens, he's going to get me there. And we translate that into no matter what happens, no matter what I do, if you're supposed to be there, he's going to get you there. Calvinists may be the, 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 the ones leading this charge, might be, shouldn't be, if they read the Bible, right? I'm going to point out what I mean by that in a minute. Once again, look beside of you. Look behind you. Look in front of you. These people, these people, Christ will get there, but he intends to get them to the end through your exhortation of them, through your premeditated, how can I speak into their life? How can I stir them up to love and good works? Your exhorting of them, verse 13, is what is the the drawing of swords and hammers and axes against the forces of evil that want to harden everybody's heart in this room and deceive them by sin. That's real. Don't listen to me. Look at the text. Look at it. Look at his heart. Take care, brothers and sisters. Take care. Open your eyes, look at one another, see see the fragility, vulnerability of your brothers and sisters. And do this lest there be in one of them or in you this evil, unbelieving heart. Don't assume that non-Christians are just easy to see. Okay? Don't assume an unbelieving heart is just easy to see. This text makes it clear. You've got to take care. You've got to lean in. You've got to know and get to know their souls, and you've got to get to know them, and you've got to be part of their life. They may be off living some unknown sin their whole life. We've heard some recent stories about that happening, haven't we? We read some of these Christian news and so forth that there's these, these people live these lives and all of a sudden they die or something happens and things come out that it's like, goodness gracious. So did the church know and they just didn't step in and encourage them? Love, do good works, hate the works of the devil, hate the darkness. Maybe these guys had that life because they never, nobody had them over for the meals. Nobody said, let me do life with you. Let me walk with you. Let me know you. Let me take care of you so that if I see dark deeds, I can spur you on to love and good works and exhort you. Verse 13, exhort one another every day as long as it is called today so that you may not be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. Exhort one another on Sunday once a week, as long as it's called Sunday. No. Every day, as long as it is called today. I suspect for the majority of us, perhaps all of us, if we are going to be obedient to this command, a radical life change will need to happen. New priorities will have to happen in our lives. Marriages, spouses, we're going to have to have some tough conversations together, won't we? About how we're shaping our week and what we're doing with it. Don't let me sound as though I'm just assuming and rebuking you. I'm, I'm not. I get it. Like, I'm, I'm speaking to me, my own marriage as well. Like me and my wife, we've got to keep pressing on this because the American vision of life and the American way of life does not naturally drift towards get together with people, host people, have meals with people, get to know them, cry with people, celebrate things with people that they like. And you're like, 
What's the deal with the Trekkies? I, you know, like just be willing to love people, even believers, because if Star Trek preaches the gospel to their soul, you should be able to join in. Star Wars does it for me occasionally. We've got to labor in this because our American way of life will, is going to lure us the other way. And even bigger than America, Satan and his schemes are going to go after your heart and the comforts of it to lure you against the everyday practices of following Christ that involves exhorting one another. I said I'd, my comment about the Calvinists kind of I think is addressed in verse 14. It's like he knows that somebody listening is going to say, wait, 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 wait. I won't have an evil, unbelieving heart if, I'm in, if I've been given to Jesus. He says not a single one will be plucked from his hand. They all will make it. Don't you tell me that I need to gather with the church. Don't you tell me that I need other unbelievers. Don't you tell me that my salvation somehow is affected by whether my brother or my sister tell me and, and encourage me and speak to me to go and do good works and love people and be generous and, and, and be selfless and lay down your life, be a doormat. Don't tell me that that has any impact on whether I'm saved. Hebrews author wants to remind you that indeed you are in his hand. You have come to share in Christ. If you hold your original confidence firm to the end, don't you dare write that off to somebody else other than yourself. That's to you, that's to me. If you hold your confidence to the end, as Scott prayed and just thinking about the life that I've gotten to see in Sherry Frick, I've not known them. I mean, I since we came here and we've gotten to know them, and I pray it's not the end, and I'll continue to pray that. Because this world, every time God takes one of these believers that labors and they, they're, they're just, they shine so bright and they love Christ so deeply. And every time God takes one, I just, I can't help but just get sad because it's like, God, we needed that one. The world needed that one. Man, I just, I wish they could, a hundred other people who never met Sherry Frick would meet her in the next day. Because I just think they are so close to you. And they, they, they have that aroma and it's potent. And you're going to save people through it. We have to hold to the end. And we need, man, she just connects so much to this text because the exhortation that is needed, for when I, I promise I'm wrapping up, the exhortation that is needed that's being pushed on us right now to happen every day, as long as it's called today, is because we don't know, you or I, maybe stepping into the presence of God before Sherry. It may happen this moment. That's what, that's what he's talking about. As every day, as long as it's called today, you don't know if you have tomorrow. And by God's grace, man, church, let's just, let's build one another up. Every time we gather, and, and, and this is where I just want to transition kind of concluding thoughts. The text is not about Sunday. It's not. Is Sunday included? Absolutely. Absolutely, it's included. But this is, is not as long as it's called Sunday. So please don't take the text that way. Don't read it that way. Don't let your brain or your heart believe it's just on Sunday. 
This has got to happen every day as long as it's called today. And in the other Hebrews verse, it says maybe multiple times a day as we see the day of judgment. I didn't get to uh, illuminate that. I meant to. Uh, the day of judgment, the day, as long as we, as we see the day coming, referring to the day of judgment, all you got to do is flip back to that, look at the next verse And he says, for if we go on sinning deliberately, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins. It's the day of judgment. So these guys said, you need it every day. You need the exhortation. You need the encouragement of the people beside of you. Yes, your family members. I read this text and I think it's probably supposed to be far beyond just my family members. Me waking up beside of my wife, that's going to help. She's going to be part of it but I really think I should see another believer today. And I should be considering my brain. How do I encourage them and, and, and remind them, follow Jesus, go and be selfless in all that you do. Go be a teacher who's selfless and just pours love upon children. Go be a computer uh, science at your desk guy and, and, and a computer scientist, I don't know what they call them. And, 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 and do that, and when you interact, and as you do in your coding thing, just do it humbly and do it well that your boss would look at you, that your coworkers would look at you and be like, you just, we have no faults with you, man. What's with you? And you just, Jesus is good. And go back to coding. That'll be enough. We've got to get intentional about this, people. I don't want anybody to have a hardened heart deceived by sin. Deceived by sin. I don't want one in me. I need you. My family needs you. That's what it says. Last comment. And I promise you I had no pastors, did, the, the elders, the pastors didn't ask me to comment on this. It just, it just came with the, the package. Small groups. I know that some of you are like waiting, like where are they at? What's going to happen? Are, are they happening? Can I get in one now? I really want in one. And I don't know the answers to any of those things. But this passage If you're going to turn down the opportunity to gather with some other believers from your local church, your local community of faith, I pray that you have taken this passage and prayed deeply and that you somehow, if that Wednesday night or Tuesday night or whatever, you're like, nah, we just, we ain't got it. My hope is that you know every day of every week you're, you're gathering with some believers prepared to stir up one another to love and good works. The small group's ministry is not necessarily, it's not something required of all believers. It's not. But the practice that, they're, that our leadership and many other churches have trying to take on, this, it's kind of a new development in ministry over the past couple of decades, or I don't know, maybe it's more than a couple decades, but it seems still kind of fresh, is this hope of like, it's it's witnessing the American culture and the American church, we just drift kind of into silos, come back on Sunday, go back to our silos, come back on Sunday, go back. And they're like, this does not fit the mold of the Christian life. And so small groups ministry, I think, came out of that burden. And I think it's it's one-sixth of the step in the right direction for many of us. That's pretty small. So if you want a practical baby step, I would encourage you heavily, consider, as, as I know, we're waiting, we're trying to, things are getting organized. And until then, I'd encourage you, don't wait until, it doesn't have to be organized. Start small groups. I promise you, I don't think any of the elders or pastors are gonna be like, whoa, 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 whoa. Do not start meeting pe- with people and inviting them over to your house from the church. Don't do it. Let us organize it and make sure we, we, we'll do it for you. 
I don't think they're going to do that. So by all means, if you're kind of in waiting, I, I'm giving you keys. <laughs> Unlock the gates, go. And gather. Gather on Sunday. Gather on Monday and Tuesday and Wednesday and Thursday and Friday and Saturday. And do it with intentionality to stir up one another to love and good works because you need one another. And I need you. So please, church, let's pray. Father, this is, this is just so hard. Maybe, I don't know if anybody else is feeling that, but I, I just feel like I want the rhythm of my life. I want my daughters. I want so badly for them to grow up and that they would be able to look back when they turn 16, 17, 18 and look back and say, man, our parents just gathered a lot with Christians and they were, they were constantly encouraging one another. God, I want that so badly for my daughters that it would mark their life and they'd be like, that's obviously what Christians do. Instead of what I keep hearing in America, what do Christians do? They gather on Sunday. They go to church on Sunday. God, please, please help us. Help us to obey your word. But Lord, by no means, don't let anybody leave here feeling a guilty, terrible conscience that says, that feels as though they've been condemned because that's not their rhythm of life. Your grace is more than enough. Your wisdom is more than sufficient for helping us to navigate and figure out how do we, in a healthy way, obey your command to exhort one another every day. We need you. We pray this in our Savior and our great high priest's name, Jesus Christ. Amen. Would you stand with me? Would you stand with us? At the uh, onset of Colton's message, he mentioned as uh, Christ being the center, Christ being the center, and I believe trying to, uh, through the message, direct us to Christ being the center. Well, not only do we have a song, that, that, that's kind of where that segued into, do we have a song here at the end, and not only do we have a song at the end, but we have a song that declares that very message, that Christ should be the head of all. His purpose to fulfill. Let's, let's sing that right now. Come praise and glorify our God, the Father of our Lord. In Christ he has in heavenly realms his blessings on us pour. For pure and blameless in his sight, he destined us to be. And now we've been adopted through his Son eternally.
and glorify our God, for we believe the word, and through our faith we have a seal, the Spirit of the Lord. The Spirit guarantees our hope until redemption's done. Let me send you with this benediction from 2 Corinthians 13, 14. It says this. <clears throat> Excuse me. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen, brothers and sisters. Amen. Let's go.